A mute point, an old wise tale, or the death nail for the English language. Do misheard sayings leave you humming and hawing? Well, we're chomping at the bit to get started on this one. So don't be a pre-Madonna nor a social piranha and join us as we discuss egg corns. Welcome to Words Unraveled. I'm Jess Zafaris, author of etymology books and creator of the blog, Useless Etymology. And I'm Rob Watts from the YouTube channel, Rob Words. And here we are to discuss those misheard sayings known as egg corns. Now, I don't think everyone's going to have heard of an egg corn, Jess. Why is an egg corn? Very simply, it's the mistaken use of a word that sounds similar or the same even as the word you intended to use, but isn't quite correct. Right. So these are like the things that we've just said during the intro to this very podcast. These are things like when people say, you know, damp squid instead of damp squib or nip it in the butt instead of nip it in the bud, right? Mm -hmm. I also hear around here, um, expatriate instead of expatriate. Um, and, uh, Praying versus, you'll see them in writing as well, praying mantis versus praying mantis. It's the the act of praying as in the religious sense rather than the act of praying as in uh, hunting. Yeah, this is an important thing to point out is that not all of these are conspicuous when you're talking. Because I've discovered that I may, I've been making a few of these mistakes myself my entire life. One of them is I have been saying free reign as if it meant like the reign of a king the idea that someone has been given you know absolute power but actually it's all about allowing a horse enough rain so there's no g in there no one will have noticed when i've said it but if i've ever written it to someone i've i've looked a fool sometimes we don't notice these things i think i've made that free rain error as well um and yeah uh, the term we we referenced in the intro to this podcast was um chomping at the bit. And I think that one has become so widely used that many people don't clock it as an error because they simply don't use the word champ anymore. Yeah. I mean, to most people, what it, what does what does champ mean? Well, it means champion, right? I guess it's straining, isn't it? The idea is the, the bit is the piece in the mouth. So it makes perfectly, it makes perfect sense to think that it is chomping because in the act of champing the horse, well, we're getting a lot of horsey stuff in already. Uh -huh. The horse is undoubtedly chomping at that bit. And that's one of the key characteristics of an egg corn, right? It's that it kind of makes sense. It's understandable. And what has happened is the person has heard a phrase they don't understand. It's perhaps got an obscure word in it, like champing, and they've made their own kind of sense of it. It makes sense. I, I also hear, um, you know, you, it's a thing that I think kids do as they're learning language. Um, you'll hear little kids, for example, refer to Alzheimer's disease as old timers disease. And it makes perfect sense because it mostly afflicts people who are elderly. Actually, I've got a whole list here of medical egg corns because oh. for some reason that there, there are a lot of them you have old timers disease you've uh -huh. also got mind grains instead of migraines <laughs> po post-dramatic stress disorder that's another one so, uh, i read someone talking about having corporal tunnel syndrome oh no <laughs> and uh, actually chicken pops i think is quite a common one it's often kids that have got it right and you can't really blame them for getting it wrong and another story i heard which was actually in a, a comment under another video i, I made about egg corns was someone describing how their aunt had come back from the hospital saying that one of their relatives was now in tents of care oh no <laughs> oh my goodness that that reminds me of um all intensive purposes versus for all intents and purposes and then yeah. i think people will intentionally egg corn that one to be um for all intents and purposes sometimes too oh yeah so the term egg corn it hasn't been around for very long. We're only talking a, a couple of decades, mm -hmm. right? It was coined by some linguistics professors at the University of Pennsylvania, I believe. Oh, excellent. Mm -hmm. And uh, th there were three of them, right? Uh, Mark Lieberman, Chris Potts, and Jeffrey Pullum, who were involved in the establishing of this term, egg corns. And I've spoken to Mark Lieberman about this in the past, and I got him to tell me the story. And what he said happened was that Chris Potts came to him with this letter that, that he, he'd, he'd seen where a woman had been complaining about acorns falling on her car. 
because she'd parked underneath a tree. But she hadn't called them acorns. She'd called them eggcorns. And so they were having a good laugh about the fact that, you know, actually in some accents, those two things sound exactly the same. Uh-huh. It makes sense, doesn't it? An egg corn. They look a bit like an egg and they are a type of corn. They're a, they're a seed. So, they thought, so this is kind of, this is a phenomenon of sorts, isn't it? Where you replace a phrase with a slightly wrong one, but one that kind of still makes sense. And so they said, well, what should we call it? And it was another linguist, Jeffrey Pullum, who said, let's call them egg corns. I love that salute. That's fantastic. And it makes sense. You know, I have I have a number of relatives from the Midwest who pronounce um, that syllable um, as like egg or leg or bag. Um, so that's uh, that, it makes sense that that could be interpreted that way, in particular, maybe from Pennsylvania. Yeah, but I don't even think you need to have an, an accent for which it befits for this to even occur, because I definitely come across egg corns in England and it doesn't really fit acorn egg corn they're not quite the same but it's kind of and it seems kind of like a a childish mistake but at the same time it's one that that happens and if you never get corrected on it I like it it feels it. it feels creative to some extent you know you know this is one of the things that Jeffrey Pullum said about it it was kind of a defense of it because obviously people get very frustrated by these egg corns when they come across them, you know, in the wild. Um, and he defended it by saying it would be so easy to dismiss egg corns as signs of illiteracy and stupidity, but they're nothing of the sort. They're imaginative attempts at relating something heard to lexical material already known. So that's basically what I was saying before. It's someone's heard something they don't get and they've made words they do know fit. Absolutely. I, I think it's it's the same idea and and no less, you know, worthy of I don't know, a, sort of a, a smile than when someone has read a word but has never heard it pronounced. So they'll make up their own pronunciation. Um, I, I had, I remember my big one that like blew my mind when I was in high school is I had always read the term askance, but I had never heard it say said aloud. So I assumed it was askance, like someone who is looking askins at someone i assumed they were looking at someone quizzically um but the term is askance it's looking sideways at someone as if they're doing something weird or suspicious that's very similar to the one that happened to me which was that i was pronouncing or at least in my head because i don't think i ever had cause to say it but awry as awry uh-huh always i think that's why a common one it just doesn't it just doesn't look right this sort of construction that's the same with a scance of, uh-huh. of of a as the prefix it's not one we use in that sort of context very often now my understanding is that that prefix in that context is sort of an old norse um influence it, it may be related to the same one we see in the term ado um which is a contraction and an infinitive it's the term at do contracted into ado um which is it, it draws upon the idea that the um the term for used in infinitives in in some Norse languages is basically cognate with our word at. Um, so if we had, say, more influence from Old Norse and English, we might construct infinitives as like at do rather than to do. That's wonderful, Jess. A few people have asked me about that construction, and now I have an answer. So thank Here we you. Go. Much ado about ado, as they say. Very nice. <laughs> do you have any favorite egg corns? favorite egg corns. Um, I would say the ones that I see the most probably, and, and that make, I'd say the most sense would be bold faced lie rather than bald faced lie and bare faced lie. And I've even heard a folk etymology explanation for, for the incorrect one. Um, the one I see a lot is bold faced and people will say that it's, um, it's meant to reflect bold text in headlines. It's not true. The, the original term is bald faced lie. The, the idea that you can look at someone with your face uncovered and look them in the eye and tell a lie and it doesn't show on your face is the implication there. Wait, hold on. Bald faced is correct. Or bare faced, either one. This very day I had a discussion with a, a colleague who'd worked in America. Like, So I, I work in Germany, to, to anyone watching or listening to this, um, but I work in a newsroom sometimes and I was working with someone and there was a script that described a bald faced name and I said to my friend, why has this not been taken out of this script? This makes absolutely no sense. He says, no, you hear bold-faced name all the time in America. Is that a term you've heard before? 
I haven't heard it affiliated with name. A yeah, bold it face doesn't. It name. doesn't go. So I googled it, but it's there. It's a mm. real thing. A bold face name. And I work in news. You would think I would have come across it. Is it? Is it implying that like a name worthy of bolding in text? It means a celebrity, like a big name. Oh. Well, you yeah. know that then probably so. Yeah, that would that would make sense. So perhaps like those it. are two. Yeah, yeah I don't, I'm not sure it's my favorite either. Um, but yes, the the news headline, the bold typefaces, is a folk false etymology about bold faced lie. Oh, there you go. Another one uh, that I see a lot is um, wreck havoc versus wreak havoc because we don't use wreak often. Um, it means to cause or to inflict, and it's. It's an evolution of an old English word meaning to avenge or to drive out, but we don't use it that often aside from in terms like wreaking havoc and wreaking revenge. It's always um, it's always chaotic. Uh, so I imagine it, it makes a lot of sense that we would replace it with wreck. Yeah, there are these old verbs that we don't use so much anymore that can trip people up, right? Another one is wet your appetite. Right? Uh-huh. And mm-hmm. you wouldn't hear necessarily the difference between wet and wet, as in W H. Et, uh, but there is a difference, and the thing is, the idea of wetting your appetite makes perfect sense to people, mm. right? You think of like that dog with a soggy tongue, your mouth watering, yeah, like, oh, yeah, exactly. So wet your appetite, yeah, people use it, but it's it's not technically correct. It almost makes more sense than the sword metaphor implied in wetting your appetite. Oh yeah, yeah. Can you explain that one for me? Oh yeah, it just it's just like using a whetstone to sharpen a sword. W H E T. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean when was the last time actually I don't know, Jess, maybe you come across a whetstone more often than I do, but I, I I can't think of the last time. I think mostly I just read a lot of fantasy fiction, so it comes up a lot. <laughs> there we go. There we mm-hmm. go. Uh let's get down to, to brass tacts with this one. Um that's another one. Brass tacts. Uh-huh. Pass mustard. There's another I one. Also- I'll mm. hear um, people using um, weary when they mean wary these days, like be weary of some of some danger when they should be saying be wary of their da- of that danger, because I think they don't um, either. Maybe they mishear it or um, they're just as unfamiliar with that older word that means to be prudent or cautious. This is an interesting one, actually, because is that an egg corn or is that just someone using the wrong word? Oh, that's a good question. When does it become an egg corn when does it just become you know bad word choice i think the distinction as we've sort of uh, alluded to is that it makes sense and i agree that weary makes a little bit less sense in this context than the term wary um the i'm assuming they simply haven't heard the term wary or haven't maybe seen it in writing um when they use that the other one that I'll see, which doesn't quite make as much sense, but is a uh, homonym or homophone, apologies, um, is baited breath. It's sometimes misspelled as fishing bait, which maybe they think right. it's like catching in your throat. Maybe that's the logic there. But the actual term is related to the word abate, meaning to reduce or end something. So your breath is halting or shallow. A lot of these are down to fossil words, aren't they? Words that mm-hmm. don't exist in another context. So we've no way of knowing what they are and, and baited. I don't think we use baited other than, as you've just said, a, a bait, for example. We don't use baited in any other context. So people can't be blamed for being surprised when they come across it. Yeah, it's interesting. The The more um, Latin derived word like diminish tends to come into more of the contexts where we might have previously used bait. So when I put up a video about egg corns, I took my usual quite laissez-faire sort of approach or laissez-faire. I get corrected on how I pronounce that as well. Uh, people aren't laissez-faire about it. Uh, I got a lot of people saying, Rob, why are you excusing this behavior? It's a sign of ignorance and it's something that we should be trying to, to weed out. I mean, what, what do you reckon, Jess? You know, the more I learn about uh, language, linguistics, etymology, the, the less pedantic I become, um, the more I'm excited to simply revel in the creative process of, of the evolution of words, because meaning and usage has changed so dramatically over the centuries that it's um, it, it's a little bit like railing against the sea, you know, or trying to fight the wind to let to to tell people 
um, that they're they're wrong or incorrect. Of course, I'm also an editor, um, and and if I were to see this in writing, I would correct it because I have a style guide and I uh, my publication draws authority from carefully edited works. But in everyday conversation, I I don't try to you know st- sometimes I will if I'm in the presence of someone who might be curious about the origin of the word, I'll be like you know actually. Um, here's a cool thing you may not know. Um, But if I'm talking to my neighbor, say, who doesn't particularly care for word origins and might just be like, okay, whatever, um, then I'm not going to necessarily correct them for saying chomping instead of champing. Yeah, it's generally, I think it's a good rule to say it's not polite to correct people's speech. Generally, if you are in an editorial context, it's kind of your job. Right. (laughs) I was listening earlier today, I I won't explain why, but I was listening to an old radio show from 1978. It was a BBC Radio 4 show. So anyone in Britain will know that that is the the sort of the ponziest of all stations in the UK. Uh, Some would say pretentious. I couldn't possibly comment. But on it, a woman was (laughs) complaining about the use of mute point instead of moot point. Interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what I think is interesting here is in 1978, she wouldn't have had a word that mishearing she wouldn't known that it was an egg corn but and i think we tend to think of these errors as as a modern thing something that the generation below us is doing right that it's it's a modern ignorance but we're still complaining about the same ones back in 1978 right i think uh i think a lot of this comes from sort of the push in from like the late 1850s to the mid 1950s to standardize and generalize and um and you know edit the way we present our our information. I think there's also a little bit of perhaps a dash of classism to it because there are plenty of there are plenty of terms that we might call eggcorns that might simply be termed dialectical. It's always really fun to read people's eggcorns. So if you are watching this on our YouTube channel, then you know, pop a comment below. If you're not, you can always get in touch with us on our social media and you can you can let us know your own eggcorns because it's great to just add to the big list that I've got in front of me here. I will say uh, the most entertaining variation on egg corns, which we have not addressed yet, um, are malapropisms. And this is where it gets really funny. You know, it's one thing to, to mistake a, um, a fossil word for a modern word, but, the, the, but malapropisms are where they, uh, they really go off the rails. That's interesting, actually, because I'm now wondering, uh, we should explain what a malapropism is, of course, mm. but I'm now wondering if like the weary, wary thing lends itself a bit better to the malapropism than to the egg corn. Because really what we are talking about, about mal- malapropisms is, well, the term malaprop, right? Jess, shall I allow you to explain what it means? Because it, cause my point is going to make way more sense after you've explained where the word malaprop comes from. Gladly. Um, like egg corns, malapropisms are when you mistake a word for one that sounds similar, but they're a little goofier and they're, they make a lot less sense. Um, they get their name from the character Mrs. Malaprop from the 1775 play The Rivals by Richard Brinsley Sheridan. And she gets her name from the French malapropo, meaning badly for the purpose or inopportunely or inappropriately. And she... She falls into this trap because she aims for unnecessarily grandiloquent language or what you might call flowery or purple prose. She'll say things like the pineapple of politeness instead of the pinnacle of politeness. And it gives me the hydrostatics instead of it gives me the hysterics. Um, (laughs) My favorite quote of hers is, if I reprehend anything in this world, it is the use of my oracular tongue and a nice derangement of epitaphs. By which she means, if I apprehend anything in this world, it is my the use of my vernacular tongue and a nice arrangement of epithets. And what she means is, if I understand anything, it's the English language and descriptive words, which is hilarious because she obviously does not. <laughs> I hadn't actually spotted the irony in, in that fact. Before. It's so good. Another one that I like of hers is, she is as headstrong as an allegory on the banks of the Nile. <laughs> <laughs> I'll agree. These are all very haughty words, but completely, yeah, inappropriately used as uh, Mrs. Malaprop is is wont to do. In the um, Concise Oxford Dictionary by Henry Watson Fowler, he describes her as the matron saint of those who go word fouling with a blunderbuss. 
It's one of my favorite descriptions of all time. <laughs> Word fouling with a blunderbuss. Glorious. There's another phenomenon, uh, mondegreens. Do you know about mondegreens? I've heard of these. Tell me about them. So mondegreens are, well, they're mostly known as mid misheard song lyrics, but they're mm -hmm. not necessarily song lyrics. They don't have to be. But the term comes from a specific song. It's a Scottish folk song called the Bonnie Earl or More. And so the song to some people's ear goes, am I going to put on a Scottish accent here? I think I might have to. I, I, my apologies, but the, the song just doesn't work if I don't. You'll do better than I. <laughs> well, I'm not so sure. So the song goes, Ye Heelands, ye Lowlands, o war ha ye been, they have slain the Earl of Mori and Lady Mondegreen. Lady Mondegreen. Lady instead of, Mondegreen. Instead of laid him on the green. Oh, that's very good. They have mm -hmm. slain the Earl of Mori and laid him on the green. There is no Lady Mondegreen. She does not <laughs> exist. But... I'm sure people will rack their brains and find that they have a few Mondegreens of their own. One of them for me, quite, I was going to say quite a recent one, but my <laughs> my knowledge of pop music is is not great. And this is actually, you know, this is probably five years old, isn't it? I don't know. Ciao Adios by Anne-Marie. Do you know the song? It goes, Ciao Adios, I'm done. I swore blind for a long time that it was Saddle the Horse, I'm done. <laughs> nice. Which kind of works, doesn't it? Uh, it does. I don't know what it is about me and horses, though, because there's also Old Town Road by Lil Nas X, which I was mm -hmm. sure he was taking the horse to the hotel room. Oh, down, yeah. Mm -hmm. down, down the Old Town Road. I think there I missed that one, too. Um, I, I always, uh, when it came to, like, any, like, Latin songs in church when I was a kid, sometimes that would come together uh, as weird words that I didn't understand. Like, I didn't understand who Ec Chelsea was and what the Deo was happening. So... <laughs> <laughs> one of the most famous ones i suppose is Jimi hendrix right excuse me while i kiss this guy instead of excuse me while i kiss the sky uh-huh so i suppose you might be able to say that uh mod degrees are malapropisms but a little more musical or perhaps a little more poetic it's tempting to think that these are a uniquely sort of english thing right we tend to think oh we have so many synonyms and and quirks to our language that these are these are these are these have got to be an English phenomenon, but it, it will or will not surprise you to learn that they're not. Can I can I run you through some some foreign egg corns, malapropisms, and mondegreens? I would I would love to hear these. <laughs> these were left um, by viewers of my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm going to attempt to read them, and much as I did with my Scottish accent, I'm going to struggle with some of them because they're languages that I don't necessarily understand, but. Um, for example, I got this one from uh, Victor who said, uh, here's an egg corn in Norwegian that I like. It's the phrase, or for jerntepe, which means to momentarily forget something you know or something you're about to say, like when you're doing a test in school and you know the answer to the question, but it's just evaporated from your memory. We've all been there, right? Uh, in, Eng in English, that phrase literally means to get an iron curtain, which is pretty cool. It's the same origin as, you know. Huh. Uh, the, the, they use the same term for the, the historical iron curtain as well. But the common egg corn for it is or for hjerntepe, which means to get a brain curtain. Uh, I mean, that makes that makes sense to me. So it's a classic egg corn, that one. Yeah. I like that one a lot. One from Spain. The actual phrase is montar un pollo, which means to make a scene. The uh, word pollo isn't used very often now, but it refers to a type of podium judges and orators used to climb in order to give a uh, speech. More important to us to judge someone, this person says, this is from uh, Bronson and company. So montar un pollo meant to embarrass someone. So that's pollo, P-O-Y-O, -O, right? I think you can probably foresee the mistake people made. Uh, people nowadays write montar un pollo, as in P-O-L-L-O, Ah. Which means to ride a chicken instead. To ride a chicken. I love it. Do you have more? Well, I've, I, yeah, I've got quite a lot of these, to be honest. Just, <laughs> <laughs> I, won't do, I, won't do, I won't do them all because uh, I think it might be getting excruciating. But uh, a couple of French ones. I, I'm a bit more in my wheelhouse with, with I can French. Do that, yeah. <laughs> so um, they have a phrase which is uh, le poteau rose, which means mm -hmm. uh, you discover it. It's découvert. Le poteau rose, right, which means to to uncover a secret. I think the it means to uncover the rose part, and the rose part is where ladies would keep their perfumes. But uh -huh. a lot of the time, it gets 
misheard or or missaid as uh, le poteau rose, and that means the pink pole instead. So you're uncovering the pink pole, which is uh, that sounds like a euphemism. Ah, it's filth. It's pure filth, <laughs> Jess. Pure filth. I wonder to what extent the uh, the pink pole is an intentional one. Yeah, well, exactly. People just finding any excuse to. I was going to say to, to shove it in there, but it's. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I love it. Oh, I don't love it. It's terrible. Uh, uh, <laughs> rescue us. What else can we say about egg corns, malapropisms, and mondegreens? So some of my some of my favorite ones that I have seen, or at least the funniest malapropisms I've seen, are on the uh, subreddit Bone Apple Tea, which is named after someone um, writing, I believe, on Twitter originally the term Bon Appetit as Bone Apple Tea. <laughs> Which is hilarious and, and totally off the mark. Yeah, I, this is one of those ones I think that only happens in the States because there's no one in Britain that would pronounce the, the you know, the bon as... Bone. <laughs> but I, I've heard it more commonly in America pronounced kind of with that, that O sound instead. So I can see how it happens. We can we can mis mispronounce anything in French over here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't... Actually, I, it's a whole nother... A whole nother? Sorry, it's a whole other conversation to be had about whether or not uh, American attempts at French are better or worse than British attempts because I've got I've got I've got views on that and they might not Ooh. be the views that you think yeah I but would love to, to discuss future episode um but some of my favorites from that community are um someone replaced the word capybara with chupacabra there this is like a picture of a of a <laughs> capybara and they're like look at this cute chupacabra um and then uh someone said uh lemonade instead of laminate for the plastic you put over a, a piece of um like uh paper the, doc the document yeah. is surely ruined uh, of course <laughs> and then um my favorite i think was um roast history instead of rotisserie for a chicken you did a roast history chicken <laughs> probably not as fresh as you would want <laughs> <laughs> I, I i'm actually really trying to think it, if that even makes enough sense to be an egg corn they're like, very off the so, wall that's that that's so why they're my far. favorites these i don't think any of these are egg corns i think these are solidly in uh, in malapropism territory uh, i think you might be right on that one um before we go you do you want to admit to anything i want i, I have some stuff i need to get off my chest uh, about uh egg corns that i have to admit to myself having made a video about it and and kind of sneered at other people for them i've Ooh. realized that i've been um culpable for quite a few myself i'd say when i was younger i was I was perfectly unaware of whether the phrase was nip it in the bud or nip it in the butt, because I, I had no idea that like that clipping a bud off of a plant would be called nipping it. Um, that didn't, that didn't come to mind. So nipping it in the butt sounded, sounded perfectly logical to me at the time. While we're on butts, actually we've, we've missed one, haven't we? Which oh, is oh. butt naked and Buck but naked, right? Uh -huh. And the, the reason I haven't mentioned it this far, thus far, is because we don't know which one's correct, right? Out of those two, uh, this is one of the ones I, I, I tried to discuss with Professor Lieberman, and he was googling it while I was there, and he was just like, "We just don't we don't know whether it's butt naked or buck naked, but they both work." My understanding is that there's a little bit of dark history there, um, with especially yeah. with buck. It's it's um, meant to um, imply say a, an indigenous person who doesn't wear many clothes or perhaps wears buckskin um it's kind of a my turn my understanding is that one is a particular americanism describing native americans in a racist way yeah i think the best thing to conclude is just say naked right, right. Just, just, <laughs> just 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 skip that one altogether mm -hmm. um a little one... redundant anyway <laughs> yeah exactly don't bother mm -hmm. with it don't bother with it uh one that i have been getting wrong and i think i continue to get wrong occasionally because um i'm just i'm just so used to it is i've been saying pain staking instead of pains taking pains taking right yeah if you think about it pain staking i staked some pain on it so you know it's it, it I, i've really really tried um but it's not that it's you're taking pains which is a phrase that i obviously knew but but i never put the two together and yeah i've been Saying it wrong on the radio, on the television, my entire <laughs> career. I'm not sure that anyone will catch that one too, because if you say it quickly enough, they kind of blend together. This is how I get away with it. Mm -hmm. Another one, uh, down the pipe. I think I've been saying down the pipe when I think it's, is it down the pike? Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and my final admission is I've been saying just desserts like it's um, edible desserts, mm -hmm. not things you deserve. Well, at least that one is uh, is uh, a homophone. Yeah, I've been getting um, away with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the evil laugh. This <laughs> okay, Jess, I think that is the whole kitten caboodle when it comes to eggcorns, malapropisms, and mondegreens. Yes, we hope we've educated you in one foul swoop. But don't worry, we'll be back at your beck and call. Thank you so much for listening today. And in the meantime, be careful. It's a doggy dog world out there. <laughs>